you ended up having a chance encounter with the Taliban. And so they'd said to me, look, if, you know, to be successful in this life and the next, you do it with this. And he picked up the AK-47. And that statement that he made, that whole thing, that got me. I was like, yeah. And that's when the first jihadist propaganda started to come out. They were on CDs at the time. So this is when I started to consume a lot of this, you know, newly minted propaganda coming out of there. How did you get the CD? Good question. This guy's on it. When you got the news that day on 9-11, how did you feel? I actually felt good, okay, in that the U.S. was the enemy, the U.S. got hit, good. And that's one of the emotions. I would, I would be dishonest if I left that out. Mubin Sheikh was a normal Canadian kid who almost became a terrorist. Today, Mubin recounts the events that sent him hurtling into the arms of the Taliban, the ball of emotions he felt on the day of 9-11, and how he turned over a new leaf and became an undercover jihadi who helped the Secret Service catch terrorists. Most importantly, he dissects the mind of a terrorist and why someone would want to go down that path. He leaves no stone unturned in this interview. Here's a wealth of information and every single thing one could possibly want to know about terrorism and extremism. What is terrorism? Generally speaking, terrorism is the threat or use of violence to force a government or the Canadian definition is a government and or a non-governmental organization to do or not do something. Terrorism is highly politicized, right? We hear about, you know, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. But that is a, a, almost like a, an empty slogan in one sense because freedom fighters don't kill women and children. You were born and raised in Toronto. What happened? What triggered your journey down the terrorism route? You know, growing up here, uh, cultural community calling me one way. I went to a very strict Quran school. Public secular society calling me another way. I went to secular public school. The two are extremely different. This started to lay the foundation for an identity crisis that would hit me later in my life. Got to high school, wasn't bullied, wasn't picked on, wasn't the victim of racism. We were like the cool kids of school. Your had a school? York Memorial Collegiate Institute. Um, had a house party while my parents were out of town. Uh, unbeknownst to me, my uncle or my father had told his brother, my uncle, to check on the house while he was gone. So in the middle of the party, my uncle basically burst through the door and, you know, sabotaged the party. How old were you? Uh, I guess 18, last year of high school. What was going on in the party? Everything. And that wasn't supposed to be happening in the house was happening in the house. It was a typical house party, right? People just partying, drinking, smoking. So you were like high school age? Yeah, high school. So just the drinking, smoking shamed you? Well, when my uncle came into the house, one of the things he said to me was, you know, Mubin, we, we read Quran in this house, we pray in this house, and you brought this into this house? It was an utter act of defilement. Did your uncle catch you with the other people oh, there? Yes. Oh, yes. So red-handed? Red-handed. Oh, and yeah. then he shamed you in front of the people? Oh, yes. He slapped me in front of everyone, number, number one. And then the shaming was him just yelling at me and saying all these things. But he was saying it in my language. But uh, your friends and everyone were there? Oh, they were, well, they were, they were there and then they were running. They ran and, out. Oh, they ran out. I mean, even the house that I had, it was like, you know, uh, there's a second floor there. There's a balcony. That I, and people were literally jumping off the balcony. Like, my neighbors saw this, and like a week later... Were you embarrassed? Yeah, I was humiliated, right? Publicly humiliated, ashamed. Um, again. Did you talk to your friends after? Oh, everybody talked about that night for, you know, a while, you know, for a long while. I mean, it was the most excitement I think a lot of them had had in a long time. Were you religious growing up? I wasn't religious, I would say. I think I was uh, nominally religious, but in the Muslim context, like, yeah, okay, we go for, you know, Friday prayers, uh, for sure. Um, but then, you know, every few days I might go to the mosque, right? Instead of going every day to the mosque, right? You went to Quran school. What did you do in Quran school? Wooden benches, sitting on the floor, rocking back and forth. 
reading the Quran but not understanding a word of what we were reading. Uh, I started this Quran school, you know, from the age of five. And Why I can't, didn't you just tell them I don't want to do it? No, you, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. Not when you're five, not when you're eight, not when you're ten. You, you do what your parents tell you to do or else. But again, I'm a teenager in the West. In high school, I'm not thinking about going to the mosque. I'm not thinking about going to pray. I'm thinking about going to the club. I'm thinking about going to party. So when you made the decision to become super religious, who were you doing that for? Uh, I mean, I was definitely doing it for my family and the community, quote unquote, because my reputation had been smeared. I mean, it, you know, Mubin got caught in the house party, like, you know, the, the rumor mill. It's like faster than any high speed Internet you can think of. Um, so so I did say to myself, I'm going to get religious and the community will see me as reformed. Now they'll see me as a good, good kid now. So you swore off partying, drinking girls all day. Were you getting girls at the time? It's funny you say that. Yeah, I called myself a born again virgin. So I was like, I was, I stopped. I was like, stopped everything for three years. I. Did you meet your wife at the time? It was really strange how it worked out because one of the, a girl that I knew from the high school, um, we were, our circles crossed, uh, crossed. And like one of the guys, he lived just like a street away from me. So, you know, I'd go and, and pass by, you know, like on a Friday or something just to say what's up. And then I saw her there and then we kept talking and and she was like, she grew up Catholic. Like, you know, she's an immigrant, actually. She came on a boat from Poland to Canada. And then we kind of hit it off in one sense. It was weird. She was she was reading um, a book on Hindu philosophy called the Raja Yoga by uh, Viva Kananda, he's a very uh, prolific uh, Hindu philosopher. And uh, I, I was still in that very strict Muslim mindset. And so I told her, you know, if your views were a little different, I would propose marriage to you. That, that was my way of, and so that intrigued her. And then she had this, I think, almost mm, romanticized view of, of the East, of India and everything like that. And I'm, I'm Indian background. So by the miracle of God, we got married. I actually brought her to my house. Like my dad sat with her, spoke with her. My dad didn't think it was going to work. My dad had seen with other Indian men, uh, you know, getting these, having these relationships, white Canadian women, they never worked out. Largely, I think, because of the value system that a lot of them have grown up in. But I'm born and raised here. I've had a really good upbringing, I think, from the Western perspective. So I knew that I did not want to marry in my culture, but I had to marry in my religion. So by the miracle of God, my dad liked her and accepted and we got married. And, you know, we just celebrated our 24 year anniversary. How did you end up going to Pakistan? You're Indian, right? Right. So I went with a group called the Tablil Jamaat. The Tablil Jamaat is a group that's based in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Part of their work is they basically go to Muslim communities to encourage Muslims to be more practicing. So it's not like, you know, Church of Latter-day Saints where they come and knock on your door and just try to, you know, cold recruit you basically. This was only going to Muslim homes. So we're not trying to convert people to Islam. We're encouraging Muslims to be more observant. So the Tablil Jamaat has a system where you spend four months, if you can, in India and Pakistan, 40 days every year, three days a month, and so on. And it's basically you stay in the mosque, you know, you, you pay your own way, you just practice, observe Islam. It's, there's no politics at all. This is a very wise thing that they have done because, because of that, they don't get harassed in other countries because they're not political at all. You know, they did question us even at the border. They're like, what are you guys doing here? Who are you? And they know, they know these Jamaats come from overseas and uh, never any problems with them. And that's why they're even able to operate in Taliban areas. You ended up having a chance encounter with the Taliban. How? The, the city we went to was called Kuwaita. Kuwaita is in the province of Balochistan, which has a very particular geography. 
Um, so, you know, a lot of dry areas, like desert-like areas. Uh, and so this particular place was, there was a giant well, and the well fell into the irrigation canals that surrounded this uh, green area. And there was all this foliage growing outside of the walls and over the walls. And where the foliage kind of bent over, it created shade along the walls. And that's where these guys were sitting. And I thought, hey, let me go and invite them to our mosque program. That's what I was doing with everybody that I was meeting. So it was just another, let me go and invite these guys. And so when I came close, that's when I realized that they, I mean, these guys had weapons on them. You know, it was like... These, Guns? Oh, yeah. I mean, AK-47. I mean, there was rocket propelled grenades, machine gun, I mean, like belts of ammunition. So it was like kind of wrapped in giant belts of... So I knew right away that, okay, well, the, I mean, okay, something, something's up over here. But I was like, okay, I just, I just gave them the same dawa. And then, you know, they listened and they were kind of like um, intrigued because... I looked like a foreigner. Yeah, they can tell if you're not from there, obviously. And I clearly, I looked like I wasn't from there. And then they threw the interpreter because they were speaking either Dari or Pashtu. And I speak Urdu, but but not. Uh, and so they said to me, look, if, you know, to be successful in this life and the next, you do it with this. And he picked up the AK-47. And that statement that he made, that whole thing, that got me. I was like, yeah. So, uh, so I became enamored by them and uh, I was like, you know, I wanted to be like them, I wanted to join them. That incident, when he said that to you, were you by yourself? Yeah, me and the interpreter. Yeah. What did you say back to him? Nothing much. I, th I know I smiled and I kind of laughed because, you know, I was like, okay, like in one sense it was like, okay, but then I was like, yeah, you know, I, 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 I believe it. You know, but I was still Tablig Jamaat, so it's like I have to be, you know, on track. And so I felt good when he said it. I mean, it resonated with me. But I, in one sense, I kind of played it off. And actually what ended up happening is three of them came to the mosque in the evening. We told them where we were. I think they were suspicious of us. They were wondering, who are these people? And foreigners, or what are they doing here? So when the three, they came and... And, you know, we, they let us fire their AK-47, so, I mean, that was a little cool. They let you fire their AK-47? This is all the same day? Uh, was it the same day? It was the same day, yeah. How long did you stay with the Tablig Jamaat? So, from 95, what happened is I left the Tablig Jamaat because the Tablig Jamaat does not talk about politics and they don't, they don't allow it. They, don't, they sanction you and they warn you if you're doing that. So I now became a lot more politically aware of geo geopolitical events, things like that, because of this jihad. Jihad against the kuffar is wajib, is obligatory. This is their mindset. What were you like when you left Pakistan and came back to Canada? Uh, I kind of linked up with these guys who were a lot more talking about jihad. And it's like, because in 1996, the war in Chechnya kicked off. And that's when the first jihadist propaganda started to come out. They were on CDs at the time. So this is when I started to consume a lot of this, you know, newly minted propaganda coming out of there. How did you get the CD? Good question. This guy's on it. Did I get it in 98? Because after I got married, I went to, um, I spent, I got married in Ramadan. I spent the last 10 days of Ramadan in Saudi Arabia. So the first five of the last 10 days in Medina, the last five in Mecca, we did Eid in Mecca, and that was a two month honeymoon trip. But in Mecca is where I got the CD. It was being sold openly, pre 9-11, remember. And so I picked up copies of this CD and uh, took it back with me. And so I was consuming all this propaganda, you know, uh, the Russian military being attacked, um, con you know, attacks on their convoys, I saw my first beheading video, you know, where they cut through this guy's neck. The beheading was on the CD? Yeah, beheading was on the CD. Why is it being allowed to be well, sold openly? Is it like they turn a blind eye on purpose? Yeah, in 1998, like who, who cared about this stuff?
So for me to show up there and find a CD on, it was called the Russian Hell series. Why did you buy that one? Uh, I think uh, I was still in the mindset, man. I was still in the jihad and these are the enemies of Islam and this is what you have to do to them, right? I was still engaging in that space. And even though I was just freshly married, so I was with your wife at the time? I was with my wife at you the time. You bought the CD with your wife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did your wife say? Well, she I didn't tell. I mean, she. I brought some, some, uh, some cassette tapes and... Um, she saw it and like she was wondering like I was like but I was like oh this is just like war stuff you know and so she just kind of like okay just kind of didn't really you know she knew she knew what was on I, I you know I didn't show her but like I explained to her and she's not into that stuff at all and so that kind of helped as well because I could see that she was not about that right and I was careful not to explain to her or tell her too much of what I believed at the time because I didn't want to scare her off and later on, it's funny, I, I, I smile because later on she told me, she goes, if you did tell me that the full extent to which you had involved, we would not be married because I don't, there's no future in somebody like that. So right before 9-11, you weren't participating in anything. You were just consuming propaganda. That's right. That's right. You were I, just I, consuming. What happened to the CD? You still have it? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. For the record, I don't have it. I <laughs> know. I, I have no idea, I mean, where, where I would have gone. Um, so it was just a fantasy for you. You didn't participate in anything. That's right. Why not? So in retrospect or in hindsight, I can look at, because now, you know, where I am now is very, very different. I've, you know, gained all this knowledge and expertise, but at that time, what's happening is I have a lot of protective factors in my life that I believe that I attribute to me not crossing over that line. Stable family, both parents are at home, relatively, I mean, good experience with education. This is not to say, because again, you have terrorists who are, who have PhDs. I mean, Ayman Zawahiri, you know, former head of Al Qaeda was a pediatrician, like a physician for children. Um, so not that education do they have, but do you have you did you have a positive experience in your educational setting? So were you bullied in high school? Did you did your marks suck? Did you have a bad? No, for me it was all positive. So those were I think protective factors. That was another protective factor. Religious education was a, a big part of it, but it kind of wasn't. I mean, in that I, it was incomplete. The religious education that I had gotten was incomplete. Um, but you still knew that, you know, killing somebody in the street, you can't do that. Blowing up a building, because you can't do that, right? Like fighting, the, fighting soldiers and attacking military vehicles and military targets, that's legitimate. That's how I thought. Not here, over there. But it, I was close to the line. I, I had these, um, a, not aspirations of committing a terrorist attack in Canada, but I had aspirations to go and fight somewhere overseas. This idea that there is this Muslim utopia out there somewhere, if only you can find it, uh, is, you know, and we saw what happened with ISIS and, you know, this was a fantasy, really. Um, <clears throat> so it's the fabled reality, I think, that a lot of people create for themselves because they want to just plug out of the life that they're in. When you got the news that day on 9-11, how did you feel? I went through a number of emotions that day. <clears throat> the first thing that I felt when I heard on the radio that a plane had hit the Trade Center, tra uh, Twin Towers, I actually felt good, okay, in that the U.S. was the enemy, the U.S. got hit good. Why? Because the U.S. was the enemy, right? And anything bad that happens to the enemy is good. So you revel in that and you feel good about it. Um, at the same time, however, and that's one of the emotions, I, I would be dishonest if I left that out. But then as the day went on, this is when I heard on the radio. When I got to work, I was working in a place, uh, you know, uh, proximity card reader, everything, you know, security, there were government offices there. And when I came into the place, my employees, my bosses came up to me and they're like, Mubin, because at that time, 
I had a big beard, black turban, long robes. You went to work like that? Yeah. Hell yeah. That's how I started to dress when I came back from uh, four months Jamaat in 95. Did you get a lot of attention? People would be looking at you a certain way, right? Oh yeah, people, I mean, I got looks all the time. What did you all do? All the time. Most of the time I just ignore it. I mean, unless somebody actually said something to me and then I would speak up because I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna keep quiet. And, you know, and I've, I've had, you know, like some, um, you know, uh, confrontations, uh, hostile confrontations with people because I could see the way that they were sneering at me or, you know, and, and doing all that stuff. And for me, it was hard, you know, I was like, because I was, everything was fine. I was accepted in school because I didn't look like that. But now I look like that and people are now treating you like you're a weirdo, right? So you were at work. So I was at work. I mean, uh, and we live in a very, you know, multicultural society. People can't get away with that explicitly anyway. It's certainly not in a work context, right? Where, so even I, in those days? Yeah, I mean, you know, early 2000s, um, you know, nobody was gonna, you know, point you out for the way you dress or, you know, your cultural clothing or whatever. So my bosses came to me and they said, look, Mubin, if anybody says anything to you, you come and tell us right away. And I thought to myself, you know, this tr this terrorist attack has happened and they're worried about me and what somebody's gonna say to me. And then there were these two women that I would frequently debate with, debating religion and politics. And, and now I saw them and they were sad. They were crying because they were trying to reach their family members back home in New York. And they couldn't because the phone lines were down. So I saw the anguish on their faces and I could now internalize, like, oh, I can imagine what they're feeling. And just hearing the conversations that day, I remember one lady was like, oh, we should just bomb them back to the Stone Age. And then another, and a male colleague responds, well, the bombings is why they did this in the first place. Our bombings of their country is why they came and did this in our country and in this side. So those are the conversations that are happening. And I'm absorbing everything and going, then at lunchtime, I went home to my apartment, which was very close by. And my wife was watching TV and she's like, oh my God. And she even said to me, she goes, are you sure you don't have anything to do with this? Because the phone is ringing off the hook. And what she meant was people were calling the apartment, calling me, us, saying, where's Mubin? Is this what Mubin believes in? Is this what he supports? Like, we want to know. So who is calling? My family friends, non-Muslim friends who she knew from before that we were all friends because then they knew that Mubin got super religious and then Joanne converted and then became a Muslim and they're like, what the hell is going on? Joanne's your wife. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's happening during the day. And then I went back, finished my shift, went out in the evening and I was with the bad friends and they were jubilant over the attacks. They were all about it. And I remember my friend questioning, my friend asked them, hey, like I, I get jihad, you know, this and that, but like what's flying a plane into a building? This is not a military target. How do you, how do you justify that? And then the mouthpiece, you know, who was talking, he was just like, he paused for a moment, like he was making up an answer. And the answer that he gave was, well, they're all kufar anyway, it doesn't matter. They're all unbelievers, so it doesn't referring matter. referring to who? The, the victims, the people who were killed in the attack. And like, we both looked at each other with a look of like, nah, that does not, that does not make sense. And so you see that day, that's the experience I had that whole day. Those were the different emotions and thought processes that were going through my head at that time. And that's when I realized that, nah, this is not, I don't like this. The same day? The same day, yeah. I was like, I don't like this. So then you went to Syria to be de-radicalized later on. Do you think your de-radicalization started on the day of 9-11? Was it gradual? That's, that's a very good question, yeah. It's, uh, uh, you know, I would say in hindsight that the de-radicalization, I would say that was the, the, is when it started. It's, it's not overnight, it's not gonna be, it requires something sharp to really break away. But what was happening, it was waning. It was getting less and less because more responsibilities at home with the kids and the wife. 
So then when 9-11 happens, it's a further push away. And because it was so significant, everybody is sharing in that event, it has, a more, it has more of an impact on a person. If it was a one-off event, an attack that happened in Jordan, or it would not have had the same, same impact, right? I mean, it, it was in North America now. How do you de-radicalize someone? Well, <laughs> I think an awareness of the person's life circumstances is the first step. Being aware of a person's life circumstances so that you can understand the impact that each of those events have had on that person. Did they come from a trauma background? Were they sexually abused when they were a kid? And that's what explains their anger issues and their resentment towards the world. A lot of times we end up seeing that ideology is just a cover from other pain that lies underneath. What kind of pain? Trauma, any kind of trauma. Could be, like I said, sexual abuse. We've, I've seen that. I mean, I dealt with a guy the other day who he got caught up in a terrorism investigation in the US, uh, but you know his sisters were sexually molested by a, a family member and he felt super guilty that he couldn't do anything about it and became angry because of it and became more and more angry. And then, then he's realized, I'm just gonna kill a bunch of people. I want out of this world. And so here's a guy who got radicalized, but when you dig further back, you realize he himself was sexually abused. So uh, it, it's not surprising to me that this guy's trajectory ends up where it does. And, and lastly, I would say, and most importantly, is that rapport building with the person. That you convince them that you are there to help them because I am there to help them. I'm not, I'm no longer the you know, agent looking to catch these people and prosecute them and arrest them. There is a place for that, but to build a rapport with them so that they, they realize that you are genuinely trying to help them. And, you, and I explain my own history and my life journey and how I, where I was and where I came. And it's this ongoing process of gently challenging their views. In the beginning, I used to be hardcore. I was like, I'm just gonna hammer them with how wrong they are and that's it and they'll listen, right? It'll be logically unassailable my argument. And so of course they'll, they'll buy it. But again, that process is, uh, the human process is not just intellectual, it's emotional as well. Sometimes the parents will call and say, look, my kid's radicalized. Like my kid, he had a, you know, a neo-Nazi, he has swastika in his room. Can you talk to him? Or uh, the FBI will show up at their house and say, hey, your kid, we, we, well, we know what your kid is doing online. And they tell the kid too, we know what you're doing, we're watching everything. Knock it off. Otherwise, when we come back, you're going to prison. So you work on the neo-Nazi cases as well? So I have been handling overwhelmingly the Islamist side of things, but there is another guy who, what a great story, Chris Buckley, a former um, you know, Afghan veteran. Uh, his friend was killed overseas. He got kafir tattooed on his arm. Uh, he came back to the US, You know, got into a, a car accident vehicle, a military vehicle related accident, uh, got put on painkillers, clouded his mind. He starts to become very, you know, frustrated with his world, uh, gets recruited by the KKK. Um, he goes, you know, right down into it, got pretty high up in the organization. And then his wife realized like, I have no future with this guy. My kids have no future with this guy. So she reached out to a mutual friend, Arno Michaelis, who's also a former neo-Nazi reformed, who came to see Chris and over a period of, again, the same kind of in engagement and interaction and intervention, he even had me come on a Skype chat with Chris to say that, hey, you hate Muslims? Terrorism, they're all terrorists? I got a guy for you that you should meet. And so I came on and we had a chat and he was just like, wow, okay. Now Chris and I are colleagues. How do you know if you've de-radicalized someone? What if they're just pretending? So it depends on the context in which you're... Um, so I, I, I break it down into two categories. I divide it into two categories. What I would call like natural organic de-radicalization and then the other which is artificially induced de-radicalization. Natural organic is easier because this is somebody who has already de-radicalized and you have come upon them and you believe they are de-radicalized because they are publicly 
you know, renouncing and denouncing their previous views. And that comes at great personal cost in many cases. In this artificially induced context is different, it's difficult because somebody who, okay, he's up on charges, uh, it's gonna be another year before the court deals with his case. Deal with him on a weekly basis. And there are things that the intervener would know and should know to detect if this person is lying. Now, I'm not gonna tell you the secrets, but there is a way to determine if a person is lying to you. It, the same question will be asked, you know, different ways to see, do you waver in your response? So there are some things, but one easy way to see is if a person immediately one, pulls a 180 degree and just agrees with everything that you're saying. Yep, yep, yes, absolutely, I believe this. Yes, yes, yes. That is, that is a clear indicator that there is deception here because if a person is truly radicalized, and they are to truly de-radicalize, that will take time. So is a rejection of the world common among radicalized people? It, it is a common factor, yes. It, it shows up repeatedly. And, but you have to ask yourself, why? Why does this person resent the world? Was, some, did something, was something done to them personally? That they've come to hate the world, they, the world is responsible for all their problems. Is it because they have some cognitive impairment that they've come to believe this? We see also a lot of uh, kids who are on the autism spectrum disorder showing up in radicalization cases. One kid went from being ISIS to an anti-Muslim Christian to for about three months, Orthodox Jewish. In a lot of cases, we say, uh, extremism and hate is a drug of choice. It becomes a coping mechanism for some people. To cope with what? Their own self-hate. Their own self-hate. They hate themselves. They have maybe internalized the hatred that others have projected on them. And so they need to reflect it back. And often we see, it's in some cases, not often, but in few cases, a person is socially awkward and they need to put on this super identity for people to, if they're not gonna respect them, well then they sure as hell will fear them. I'm ISIS. Okay, then let's look at Osama bin Laden, the biggest of them all. This man was born into one of the richest families in Saudi Arabia, one of the wealthiest, a family full of millionaires. He had a silver spoon in his mouth first class university education and all of that. And he gave all of that up to go and live in the dirt, in caves, when he could have been in a palace. How do you explain his story? I mean, where is the re resentment of the world and why would he hate himself? He had everything. He hated his family. He was one of 40 something kids. How much daddy time do you think he got? How much daddy time did he get? Where were his, what kind of peer groups could he possibly have in that context? Very excluded, restricted bubble. So like some anybody else that we've seen that quest for significance, I wanna be somebody. What am I, one of 40 kids living here? What, I could totally see how he looked at this and said, this is not, this is garbage. I don't like this life. I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna have brothers because I got money and you can sh sure as hell, if you show up with money, the friends will come. And his friends came, his brothers came, his new family. Why do Muslim terrorists have big beards? <laughs> so the, remember my, my, you know, the number one cause of Islamophobia in the world are terrorists dressing as Muslims. Terrorists who dress as Muslims. That's why they have big beards. Because the Prophet السلام, had a big beard. The Prophet السلام, wore a turban. The Prophet السلام, wore robes. So what they do is they take a literalist approach to the scriptures. 
There's no nuance. There's no depth in their understanding. And the Prophet salam himself said about the Khawarij, the Khawarij were a group of zealots who would emerge early in the Islamic period and they would appear throughout the Islamic time and the Islamic periods up to modern time with groups like ISIS in particular. The Muslim scholars, Sunni scholars, and even Shia scholars agree that uh, the, the ISIS are Khawarij. So they are this, they, they are a, the modern manifestation of this ancient group of zealots that the Prophet ﷺ warned us about. And he said specifically about them that they would recite the Quran, but it would not go beyond their throat. So it was just on their tongue, it was superficial. The Prophet ﷺ said about them, they will strive hard in worship, praying and fasting far beyond what you pray and fast, but none of it will benefit them. So this is how they have been described. Uh, he describes them also as they will have long hair, some of them, some of them do, especially the ISIS guys, Al-Qaeda guys as well. So, so when you see that caricature of the Muslim terrorist who's in the, he's got a turban and he's got the beard, that's because of people like Osama bin Laden. They have created that caricature. The media didn't invent this out of thin air. It's these bearded terrorists who were doing terrorism that people said, oh, that's what the terrorist looks like. Is it an intimidation thing? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, but also keep in mind, I mean, when we look at terrorism, because, you know, even when I study terrorism as a topic, you know, terrorism has, I mean, it's been around for thousands of years. It's been, you know, it will always be there. You can go way, I don't know how far back you want to go. You can go to the bearded zealots uh, in the Jewish kingdom in the early century, the Sikari, right? The dagger men who would, they were Jewish zealots who would stab up Jewish leaders who they considered to be sellouts to the West at the time, which was the Roman Empire. You see what I'm doing? Like juxtapose that today, it's the exact same thing. We see that there is, when we say there is no single profile of a terrorist, we mean that. They're not all, you don't, if you believe that the terrorist is a guy who looks, you know, scary looking Arab dude with a beard, well, then my uncle's a terrorist, you know, <laughs> or... And, and, and if you use that as a rule, and what are you going to do is stop people who, with beards who look scary to you? Like, that's not how you find terrorists. Are a lot of terrorists virgins? Um, that's an interesting question because I used this one screenshot from... Um, so when, when I, the whole ISIS thing was happening, there was Ask.fm, which is a platform on which people can go and ask questions. And there were ISIS fighters who had traveled over from different Western countries who made themselves available for answers. And one of the questions was asked, are there good looking women there? Okay. And I use that in my presentations when I teach and people laugh at that, of course. And at the bottom, it actually says, Ittaqillah. The answer is fear God. Okay. He's trying to be some virtue signaling. He's trying to say, oh, you know, don't think about that. Don't, you know, but then we saw them, what kind of, you know, rapist. Uh, animals they were when they were uh, over there but it's I, I laugh because you are dealing with overwhelmingly young males who have this impossible gender separation dynamic that it's no wonder the only way for you to get any is to blow yourself up I would just tell them to get a girlfriend while they're here like I mean you know be a normal person so I, I but I mean this that they do come from very strict gender separation dynamics. If you can't even have a regular conversation with a female without there needing to be this, oh my God, I'm hypersexualized over this whole experience, then you know it's no surprise to me that part of the dysfunction that comes out of that sexual repression is violence. Do terrorists fear capture? Absolutely, they do. It's one of the reasons why they like to blow themselves up. Is part of the fear torture? I think that is a part of it. Um, I don't think the U.S. tortures as much as we think it does, if I can put it that way. Um, what they fear is being exposed because they've lived this life and now suddenly they're going to be, you know, uh, publicized as having been caught, probably with a very unflattering photo in the paper, and then having to sit in a prison cell 
I mean, you know, no more freedom. They would, they would rather kill themselves. They would die. They would not stay in a prison. So it's actually worse for them to be caught and then to be sentenced to prison for the rest of their life. It does torturing terrorists work? It does not. They don't reveal information? They'll tell you whatever you think, whatever they think you want to hear. That's how, that's what happens with torture. Um, I mean, if you can imagine if somebody's torturing you saying, did you do this? Did you do this? And you didn't do it. And you say no, and you keep getting tortured. Well, to stop the torture, you're going to say, yes, I did do it. And it's very known that you, you will not get credible and reliable information. And torture is a sinful activity for those who are believers. It's a sinful activity for which, you know, you have to answer to God. So do terrorists actually strap bombs to kids? Does that stuff actually happen? Oh, of course it does. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, exploiting kids for so Boko Haram, for example, did a lot of this. Uh, they would they would ha recruit women to do it and they would even um, pack the bomb in such a way that it appears that she's carrying a baby. But does the woman know? She knows. Oh, she knows. Oh, she knows. Oh, no, she goes willingly. I mean, whether it's brainwashed or coercion, we don't, you know, could be different in depending on the circumstance because we know people have been forced to do that. Um, but then others who willingly do that. Um, the use of children as a weapon of war, um, you know, is a, a problem across the board. All these groups do it. Uh, the use of children. Uh, they even used a donkey. They put a bomb on a donkey. They put a bomb on a, it was a donkey cart. You know, they put, uh, in the Afghan context, uh, the one guy came to kill Burhan al-Din Rabbani, I think it was. His turban was a bomb. His own turban was a bomb to kill the the, the former Afghan president, so. What does terrorism look like today? A lot of intelligence agencies are saying that anybody can be a target. You can be targeted for anything now, your ethnicity, your gender, whatever. And a lot of terrorists, most terrorists are actually acting on their own now, rather than being affiliated with a group. Is that true? Yes, because there is this, um, there is this, I think, um, bias, cognitive bias, uh, analysis bias where because we were so accustomed to terrorists belonging to groups. So I, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, this group, that group. And that was a particular generation, I'm going to say, where it was like that. Today, so looking at ISIS members, for example, what constitutes ISIS membership? You declaring allegiance to the group. You don't need to go there and obtain training from them. And there's no, like with Al-Qaeda, you cannot say you're a member of Al-Qaeda if you're a supporter of Al-Qaeda. Because Al-Qaeda vets its people. Like you cannot just show up and I'm Al-Qaeda. But ISIS did this. ISIS says, you are a member. If you declare allegiance to us, you're a member. No connection at all. This person has self-activated, has themselves said, I am going, I'm, I'm a member of this group. Now shift it further. You don't need to be a member of a group. If you just hate the world, you want to see people get killed, you want to manifest your anger and frustration onto X group or whatever, you might not even want to target a particular group. Let's say, you know, like in incel targeting, for example, where they'll see men who are with women who look like they're happy, who look like they're having a good time. They'll target that because that represents the happiness that you women have taken away from me. But isn't that horrible from the victim's point of view? Because you never know when it's going to happen, right? It can happen at any moment. You can be a target. That part, you never know what's going to happen. That applies to all the terrorist attacks, whether it's an ISIS guy or whatever. ISIS is not going to, they just, they, they just kill anybody. If you get a group of people and you kill them, good on you. So there's no predictability today? I mean, let's just use the same example that you use. Let's say you're, you're walking down the street with your girl or something, and some guy just veers his car off and comes right at you. I mean, what can you do? And how do you know that that didn't happen and you were just, you were a, a, you're not, I mean, you're still a targeted victim, you're still a target, but you could just be a general target as opposed to a specific target. Right. And it could be it could just as easily be like the, the uh, you know, the attack on Young Street. Right. Alec Manassian, for example, 
okay, he would have looked to see. I mean, I think there were two men who were also killed in that, but he may have looked at that moment and there just happened to be a group of women who were there. And that's what he saw. But they would be no different if he declared that he was an ISIS member. It's the same. The end result is the same. You're still dead as a victim. You got targeted because you just happened to be there at that moment. So how do you stop this then? They say it's on the rise. Well, especially nowadays when you have, you know, social media, there's no responsibility by social media companies. Zero. Um, they can flag things. They can put the money into that effort. They don't. They don't. Because they're not made to. They don't have to. You're going to force them to do it? It's going to cost them millions of dollars to have teams who are monitoring spaces and making sure it's going to cost them many millions of dollars. They're not going to spend that money. It's all about the bottom line in a capitalist system, right? Everyone's using the platform. So what? They know. They're not. I mean, they, you think they don't know that child sex predators use their platforms, terrorists use their platforms, organized criminals use their platforms. They know all this. I watched with my own eyes how, how, how ISIS was recruiting and growing on Twitter. With my own eyes, I saw it in real time for several years before they started to, then let's have a discussion, does deplatforming terrorists work? Like, you wasting your time on qu stupid questions like that while they're proliferating recruiting. And that's, what, that's the question you're asking? And then by the time you even get around to actually banning accounts and this and that, it's, isn't it too late? The damage is already done.